This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to the Self-Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. This episode is a perfect example of a conversation going where it needs to go. I wanted to bring on a few of my close friends and co-founders of PTA Global to talk about what it is that we learned from creating that company years ago. I believe that the insights that we gain from growing that organization are critical to the success of any business whose success in turn is based on continually bringing value packaged in an engaging experience to their customer, which is well, pretty much everyone. In this episode, we talk about the lessons that we learned and who we all became because of the many successes and failures that were involved in creating a global brand. What I appreciate about this conversation is its honesty, vulnerability, and authenticity. We had a lot of fun doing this, but we also pulled no punches. Through a company called FitPro, we presented at an event called Meeting of the Minds over a decade ago. That conference brought in two dozen speakers who were considered to be the best in the health and fitness industry at the time. It wasn't our moments on stage, but our moments in the audience where we started to collectively imagine a client-centered industry driven by collaboration, co-creation, and a commitment to a common mission. So we got together with Paul Taylor, who was the founder of PT Academy out of Australia, and we started to create a framework for this vision that was emerging. This conversation explores our perspective on what were the best and worst aspects of what happened as a result of that vision. Okay, so why are we here today? (laughs) I think we, we wanted to get together and talk about kind of a venture that God, so many layers and so much impact, unforeseen impact in our life. It's going back to when we started as a team, uh, as a team of co-founders, actually, PTA Global. And just talk about, because right now there's so much messaging coming out of a certain sector of self-help. And this is the self-help antidote. And, And it's kind of like, this is who you should be. You need, to, you need to grind 24-7. You need to be an entrepreneur and just keep grinding and working without a lot of insight as to what that looks like tactically or strategically. And that's good for a portion of the population. You know, there are some people that are entrepreneurially minded. There are other people that just, if they're honest with themselves, not only are they not suited for it, but it not, might not line up with what it is that they really want. And I had a conversation weeks ago with a brilliant lady by the name of Susan Sly. You know, she's gone into some really difficult industries and just become an absolute weapon in every industry she's ever went to. And she asked me, well, what's the first thing you need to think about when starting your business? For me, it's always been, why do I want this? I think that's a good place to start is why did we start PTA Global? What exactly happened after we started it? Where are we and where is the organization now? And what are the best, worst, and most surprising frames we can place on it to kind of extract lessons from the past and carry them to help us build a future with more possibilities, more inspiration? you know, become better versions of ourselves because of the lessons we learned from reflecting on where we've been. That's the conversation I was planning on having. You guys on board wow. with this? Yeah, it was a, it's every chance, Hoppo, that that conversation won't happen. And we'll probably talk about rugby union or something else. I, I was going to say, I was just going to defer <laughs> to OD. I was like, that's a big question. I'm going to oh. just say, OD, all yours. And then I'll confer <laughs> and say, yes, I agree. So rugby union then. Okay, great. <laughs> not, not the typical subject matter for the self-help antidote audience. However, you know, some people might be going, it's about time. It's I about agree. Time because, about sports. because when you look at it, realistically, I, you know, Hoppo and I coming from a footballing background, uh, Richard coming from a footballing background, Rodney coming from a footballing background, Michelle coming from 
Farming. We're not sure what background you come from. Farming background, I think. Farming. I come from <laughs> a Tourette's <laughs> background. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know, works I, great in the stands. Oh, absolutely. Like, like for, for a guy with Tourette's, like being at a live sporting event is the perfect place. Like nobody's going <laughs> to notice. Well, I think, I feel, I don't think, I feel that the biggest thing that we all the, the reason why was the fact that we wanted to create something as a team that would actually change the industry or put the industry in a more positive direction. And, you know, we'd all met way back in 2002 and along the, the journey of life, it's been interesting. We, we started to understand that our values were all very similar. And well, I felt they were similar and for such a diverse group of people, mm we had this uniqueness in each of us to be able to not only come together, but to be able to share and almost unpack what our uniqueness was. So, you know, the why was to, in my perspective, was to be able to create a better opportunity for people to help other people in this industry that we call, you know, fitness and health, whether it's wellness, whatever the title may be. And our uniqueness was something that the industry hadn't seen before and was quite exciting because when we got together, it was just always a, an amazingly fun, fun and enjoyable time, not to mention a great learning experience for, for me. Yeah. Apo, as, as I'm listening to Ian, here's, here's what I'm getting from this. I'm thinking further back in time, not, not much further, but meeting in the minds. Because when yeah. Ian's saying like we all had these shared values, like what were those values? Obviously we all had a love of learning. Obviously there was a burden of leadership. And what I mean by leadership is we kind of had a vision of where people can go within the space of the industry and by extension, their clients. And we kind of imagined this future and they were like, okay, well, what are the tools, resources, strategies, and how do we communicate with people to create a movement that galvanizes a lot of people to come along with us? And it was also the value around collaboration and diversity. Because like prior to Meeting of the Minds, I think what we, wit what we witnessed a lot was people operating in functional silos as a guru. Cool. You had really smart people that fundamentally disagreed with one another, vehemently disagreed. I, I remember that I was on a project where I was the head of training and development for fitness on a, on a major health club chain. And we had launched that year a conference. And one of the funniest things was we had people in the organization and their whole job was to usher specific presenters, making sure that they never cross paths because they would fight. We were afraid of a physical <laughs> altercation. It's like, what is going on in this industry? And then we go to meeting of the minds and, and it's on top of a mountain, literally. Like yeah. high elevation. <laughs> There's no way to go. Yeah, and you're in a room. It's like yeah, it, well, yeah, like from the altitude. Yeah, altitude, one beer, bye, I'm gone. So I'm a lightweight. So like for Aussies, like things like what? One and a half beers at least. And yeah, I'm gonna say. <laughs> so everybody was watching everyone else's presentation. They're like, we don't disagree with, e with each other. We operate in different domains, but we all have the same vision. We all want the same things. I think it was at that event where we saw this industry can collaborate and synergize and leverage off of one another for the advantage of the people within it and the people we serve. That's what I'm thinking. I, as soon as I'm listening to talk about our values, I'm going meeting of the minds. Did, did you catch that, Hoppo? Did, or maybe something yeah. else showed up for you? No, no, no. I think, I think you're on the money there. And I would, all I would do is add to that. I think two words came to mind for me, like intuitively. One was vulnerability. I think something that we all had in common was vulnerability. And I, for me mm -hmm. personally, I think the same word is synonymous with that is courage. And it, it takes tremendous vulnerability and courage to say we have a, a story that we want to share and here's our voice. Now, for many people, you're going to immediately say, oh my gosh, I've been waiting for that. That makes sense. For other people, it may validate what they already thought and felt. 
And for, for many, I would say most, when we launched PTA Global, it was either confusing or in conflict with what they, quote, believed about health, fitness, and wellness. So I think that takes a lot of vulnerability and courage to say, here's our story of what we think we're here to do. But I think it came from, to your point, Bob, is the, the, the means of the mind, what I felt, and here's my caveat, I was the last one to the table at PTA Global, and it was kind of by happen chance that I even arrived as a co-founder. And it's the same at meetings in the mind. This. Yeah, and it's the same at meetings in the mind. I was the last person invited with you guys and Paul Check and Mark Verstegen and Gary Gray and Gray Cook and Tom Purvis and all the, Annette Lang and all the biggest names our industry had known. I was like the last person to the dance. Like, so, so for both of these, I was the last person to the dance. So I kind of had this incredible viewpoint of, I thought I was just going to be a student and suddenly I'm quote an educator. I thought I was going to be the one listening and now I'm the one talking. Like that happened in both of those scenarios. Which but is funny. I, Sorry, because you were, yeah. you, I, I loved so many presentations. I remember them many years later. Your presentations were my favorite. I, just have to I had say nothing that. to lose because I was an idiot that shouldn't have been there. So I just, <laughs> just, kind of, just kind of opened my mouth. And, and to your point, I had that one beer at altitude and I got so sick that I, I think you guys probably remember it means in the mind. I opened with the whole idea that I'd, I've had two hours of sleep. I was up at 3 a.m. Mm. And then my, my opening took off from there. And it was just authentic. I literally just said what happened. And I kind of feel like that was, the for me, the, 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 the DNA of PTA Global's founders was, all right, take all the noise out. Here's who we really are. And here's our authentic voice. And we're just sharing with you what we think at this moment in our lives to be the key ingredients, the thing that makes mm. a difference in life between mm. one human and another. Take what you want, leave the rest. I, I've always felt that's what we did, is we had the courage and vulnerability to say, all right, we've studied with Checky, we've studied with Vestagan, we've studied with Annette, we've studied with all these people, and here's what we think are the, are the key ingredients. Mm. I didn't know many people that had that willingness to study under those other people and one of the things i personally loved about the founders is we had actually studied under all the other people mm. so when we talk about those people it wasn't from reading a, a freaking article it was from spending thousands of your own dollars and weeks of your life sitting in an audience taking notes like we were students of the people that we were you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's, we, we were no, students does, of yeah. one another as well. <clears throat> yeah. In the early days of PTA Global, not to get ahead, one of the things I loved is we all learned from one another, and, and we were we were voracious students. You, that's you know, how I met OD. He was my teacher at home. Hang, hang on, easy tiger. <laughs> so, hold on. I want to I want to take you back a little bit. Well, one thing that's interesting is you're like you just showed up and like you just got put on stage. That is literally how I got my job as being the MC of that event. Richard Boyd was the MC and he had introduced one person and he went, sat down. He's like, you know, I'm not doing this anymore. You're the MC. I'm like, I, what? I was like, that's Boydy. I was like, when do I go on stage? He's like 15 minutes when this guy's done, you're, you're up. I was like, um, oh, thanks, I guess. So I went, <laughs> I went there to be a student as well. And it was like, I was just like thrown up on stage. And you mentioned vulnerability because we hear so much about vulnerability. And it's one of those words that are se like seldomly defined, but so frequently mentioned. What do you mean? And you also said, oh, it's synonymous with courage, which I thought, oh, mm. Is it that interesting? Because I've never heard those two words paired together like that, but it makes sense. What's your definition of vulnerability? Mm. Well, the words I'll use now are probably change in the morning, but uh, <laughs> I'm just going to throw a bunch of stuff out there. It requires intimacy. I know that. It requires honesty. And it requires the absolute contemplation that what I think I know, what I think I believe, what I think I value is not only wrong, but there's probably a better way. Like I'm open to the idea that what the next person says absolutely could not only change my opinion, but might be a better way forward. And so I think 
vulnerability is that we were talking about it, Bob, before we went live. It's an emergent moment. You know, you, you I'm not just saying it because we're on the call, but you really changed how I perceived the concept of listening. And for me today... I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I'm glad your humor you wasn't here. strong then and your humor's not strong now robbie i know i know exactly. i'm married my wife tells me this <laughs> multiple times every day my filter is strong because the word i was going to say was not idiot so thank you very <laughs> <dude>. <laughs> oh man i'm gonna have to tick that explicit content box aren't i <gasps> oh i didn't do that for the last episode and it was very explicit can i get in trouble for that anyway go ahead doesn't matter was that a conversation with us or did you have that with yourself? No, that was I was just talking right. to Tiffany Cook in my head. One of the voices in my head right now <laughs> is Tiffany Cook. Thanks, Tiffany, if you're listening to this. But anyway. Two, so, decades, uh, two decades of knowing this idiot. Have we done anything other than observe him, have conversations with himself? Have we, <laughs> no. have we ever? Come on. Did you not hear the Tourette's disclaimer <laughs> the beginning of the session? How much more clear do I have to be about this shit? So what I'm hearing, you know, you, you talk about emerging. And yeah. to me, your definition of vulnerability is the emergence of humility, love, openness, and honesty. Mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and, and, it's, and it's what is conceived in the intersection of those, you could call them values or, or critical strengths that gives rise to vulnerability in the true sense. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, again, you turned me on to the, the real, you, you took me down a rabbit hole years ago of the idea of empathy being the, the, the most, the highest level of listening was empathetic listening. But, and it was at that time of my conception, but today I think emergent listening is even more powerful. You know, it, 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 I, it I would, I would agree with that. And, and I'm just going to take you back. What's the difference between, you know, cause, cause empathetic listening and emergent listening. Cause I yeah. think that's a powerful distinction. Cause let's be clear. Everything we're talking about right now is what are the lessons we learned from a past business? Cause everybody does this. And for people who are entrepreneurially in, inclined, or you might be an entrepreneur where you work better inside an organization, but you have specific passions, talents, and skills that you can mm. leverage to make the greatest amount of contribution and in turn get reward that are intrapersonal, not just material, like being fulfilled by the job you do. So when we're talking about stuff like this, it's critical because when we talk about emergent or empathetic listening vulnerability, these are not just life skills. These are business skills, especially in today's day and age when we have so much messaging. We sometimes have a hard time discerning one offering from the next. So it's things like empathy and connection and vulnerability, generative moments. That, that creates mm. distinction. So sorry about that. Just talk about empathetic versus... <laughs> Emergent listening. I, for me, and again, I, I reserve the right to change it tomorrow when it's not my bedtime. But I would say like empathy obviously is, is uh, open heart. It's the idea that I feel with the heart, see with the eyes, hear with the ears of another. Absolutely agree. But emergent is about being so present that we are open to the idea that the future will present itself in that moment. Like I, I have no idea what's about to it's living in the possibility of. Oh, I love it's that. Living in the possibility of, mm -hmm. which in my mind is limitless, right? That's the essence of potential is living in the possibility of. And so for me, emergence is about living in the possibility of. I love that definition because a lot, a lot of times people think that listening is this passive thing you do when you're not speaking. I remember we were making we were making a video series, a training series, not us, but with a health club chain that I was working with. And I remember the the head of sales said, Bobby, would you do this section? It's on listening and listening's not, it's not really my thing. I was like, that's that's good to know with a VP of sales. Listening is not my thing. Okay, cool. <laughs> 
So you're the closing guy and has nothing to do with <laughs> listening. Got that. And then the cameraman innocently made a quip and it was kind of funny, but it, it, it also revealed a lot of his attitude around listening. He's like, so I don't understand what we're going to do. We're going to film Bobby staring silently into the camera for 10 minutes. And I was like, that's funny. And that's fascinating to where listening becomes a highly dynamic interactive activity where what comes out of what emerges from that space between me and you is something that mm -hmm. could not have emerged otherwise without the mutual participation and the willingness and capacity to listen to one another through different vantage points, listening from inside, outside the conversation, from the other persons in my perspective, all simultaneously. So I, I, I that, that is a, beautiful definition of emergent listening well thank you mate i just pulled it out of nowhere but what i would say looking at this beautiful maned aussie beast on the screen he was the first to to demonstrate it to me not explain it to me not verbalize it to me just demonstrate it right and i love you know i love language which is ironic considering my past but i love <laughs> language <laughs> The idea that this guy, when I first met him, I'll never forget it, 2001 in Chicago, when he came to my health club randomly because of the bald-headed beauty called Richard Boyd that brought him in. And I know to this day, he remembers it too. It was one of those moments emergent in life where I knew life changed. And the way he, he created an environment for my coaches at that time at my health club to understand movement at a level they'd never even conceived from a basically a horse whisperer. And what it showed me was, it, the minute he told me, we went out for drinks. I don't know if you remember this, OD, we went out for yeah. drinks. I've still got a picture of me and my top coaches with you in 2001 in Chicago. And you told them the story of how you had grown up around horse trainers and horses mm. and stables. And that's how you learn to connect mm. to this creature. And they talked about that for months after. The idea that you could connect to another creature, a sentient being that you couldn't quote, speak the same language, language. to, right? Mm. And your whole point was, I've just got to be present. I never forget it. You're like, I just got to be present. And it's pretty obvious what it needs, what the horse needs. And I couldn't find the words for it at the time, but that was emergence. That was my first experience in our industry of realizing it would appear that the best people in our industry are just present to the thing in front of them. And Hoppo, you know I mean? Hoppo, what was, it was funny, I found that picture the other day I was going through and here, here we are in Chicago, I'll, I'll never forget that day at all. But what's interesting, when Bobby so beautifully talked about the entrepreneurial and intrapreneurial, and now, you know, we're talking about emergence, aren't we just talking about relationships? Aren't we just talking about how we have lived our lives? We've had to become, I mean, and I was a shocking listener, because... I thought you had to use your ears to listen. I listen more with my heart and my gut than I listen with anything else. I listen more in the ability to be able to observe the person in front of me because if you can observe with all of your being, with all of your talent, with all of your skill, that's when we can truly start to understand and appreciate the, and show our empathy and compassion and show our emergent listening because it really is just a relationship. And this, this journey all the way through, you know, from 2001 to where we sit now, we have this conversation like we're in the room because our relationships with each other are full of just what you've said, that honesty, humility, that love, because we've exposed, we've sat naked, we've emptied our hearts and our souls in front of each other. We know our highs and our lows, you're saying that figuratively, though. We've not. I'm like, saying I was say, figuratively, don't, you, Bobby. you can't mention Bobby's name and Nike without bringing up <laughs> emotional triggers. I'm for not me. going to tell I, people I I've shared rooms. Just want to clarify that one point there. Um, I need therapy in the morning. <laughs> so it's interesting, right? Because, you know, from the moment that you have both met my children and helped me with my children, the relationships we have, you know, we talk about coaches. 
And I feel the biggest coach that you can be is the coach of someone that you are unconditionally loving to. And whether that's your brother, sister, father, mother, child, best friend, whatever. Because it's in those moments that you have to be the best person you be. You, you have to be the most non-judgmental. You have to be the most trusting. You have to be the team player. You have to be the positive. And I don't mean to be the perfect. I just mean you have to be. And the thing that this team that we call PTA Global, that these people I call friends prior to PTA Global, the greatest thing they taught me, what, or not even taught me, what they gave me was permission. Was the permission to be. Now, animals give you permission instantly. Humans don't. You know, because animals, when you give, they want to give back. Humans sometimes start to use their brain and think about what's they get. They get a little bit. What's this person trying to do? You bring up so many salient points here, but I, I want to take you back to that comment about whoa, animals. Whoa, whoa. That's that's not that's not that's not <laughs> let's not inflate it too much, Bobby. No, there was one or two. There was one or two decent. <laughs> points. There wasn't a whole ton of salient points. <laughs> There was one thing that stood out in my mind. Let's just say that I recently lost my dog. Um, yep. He passed and that was, oh God, that was brutal. And when people think about listening, they think about language mm -hmm. and language in the form of words and words expand, mm -hmm. they deepen our mental maps and how those mental maps intersect with one another. But it's not just words. And anyone who's been around an animal long enough knows they don't have words, but there is a deep emotional, even kinesthetic listening. And, and, and that is sometimes deeper and more accurate than two people sitting down with a lot of words mm -hmm. over, over a beer or coffee. It's like when you're around animals, you, you get that sense when you're connected of how deep and, and, and primal that listening does and can go. And Bobby, it's that, it's that moment when you haven't got to talk. How many times have you and I been in a space where we can just be, Hopper, we're the same, you know, Roddy, Richard, we're, and it's hard for Richard because he doesn't stop talking, but when you have a scenario, <laughs> when you have a scenario, wow. <laughs> when you have a scenario though, when you can just sit there and just be, that's mm -hmm. the animal, right? Yeah. That's that's the energy, that's the feeling, that's the peacefulness, that's the moment. Popo, it's when we take that ball and we kick that goal, and all you feel is effortlessness and silence. It's that moment of just being when everything just runs fluently it's that moment that we as pta global created something that when we brought to the marketplace that we could see it working as hoppo said it took courage for the people to invest into pta global because we were different we were very different energy system development uh, human behavior functional anatomy you know science systems and tools very different perspective and we weren't saying to people that we were the ones who knew everything. We were saying, this is something that is going to create a better experience for you and your client. Because we knew that we had practiced this for years and we had practiced this on ourselves. And this is a big thing. This conversation we're having today is the conversation that we've actually had many times over on the many times we've been on the road together. OD, that's the difference right there, though. Uh, I'm going to interject and I hate to do it because authenticity... No, no authenticity what you just said is i've practiced it on myself because you can't offer what you don't have to give and more mm -hmm. importantly i've applied it with my clients patients athletes organizations mm -hmm. for years so i have found one of the biggest problems in our industry is often people don't practice mm -hmm. they don't they can't authentically offer it because they've not done it mm -hmm. that's my experience take what you want leave the rest but yeah. I, I, can't feel I it, can't coach it. An awful lot of people are literally passing on information, data. They're not passing on authentic 
experience and understanding. Passion. And yeah. for me, I'll even go to, I would say this, OD, I would say, mate, it's experience and understanding because because application is experience, right? And understanding. And I think we all vibrate at different levels of experience and understanding. And that shifts as we shift in life. And I think one of the biggest gifts of PTA Global was it was an authentic sharing of experience and understanding. We didn't try to pass on anything that wasn't authentic to us. There wasn't an underlying dogma. I, I think two uh -huh. things that stood out for me with PTA Global is we had respect for people within our domain and outside our circle. And when we recognized value, we wanted to share it. And it wasn't like, here's our system, our method. The focal point was the client, whether that client was a CEO of an organization, whether that was a fitness manager, trainer, or, or, or their client, that became our focal point. And I think the other thing that made us quite distinct, and because when you, when you take a look at functional anatomy, when you look at behavior change, maybe people weren't talking about it the way we were talking about it, but they were talking about that. That those mm -hmm. conversations were out mm -hmm. there. It's the way we brought it together out of a willingness mm -hmm. and a deep seated desire to listen because people were speaking at the audience. They weren't mm -hmm. listening. And, you know, we honestly had a lot of that too in the beginning where this is what I think people need. And people are like, no, I, I don't need that. And I don't want mm -hmm. that. And some of our blind spots was like, well, you don't think you do, but you really do. And, and, and it was like, okay, in my organization, I have 99 problems a day. And this isn't even the bottom one. So we Ooh. did have that, that element in our enthusiasm and the best of our intentions of being a little bit tone deaf. But at our core, we had this desire and this willingness to listen. And that brought all of the elements we were talking about in a way that was suddenly relevant and compelling mm. to the people in the seats because it was delivered not as our method, but this is our response to being in communication with you. And I think that's what made, in my mind, PTA Global quite different. And you know, I mean, it did become a global brand. You know, it's owned by the same company now underneath, you know, the National Academy of Sports Medicine. It's gone through a journey. It, it was owned by uh, Neil Spruce, which I thought, wow, talk about like the circle of life. Neil Spruce <laughs> gave me my first mm -hmm. shot out there in the fitness industry as a presenter, as an educator. And I was like, okay, wow. Okay. Neil owns the company that we used to, to have. That That's pretty interesting. And, and I think it would probably be a good time to explore. Well, what was the, 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 and for those of you listening right now, we had a ritual where at the end of just about, not everyone, but every event, we would sit down at a table, all of us. And, you know, some of us would get beers, order food, but we were debriefing and we would go through an exercise, best, worst, and most surprising. And we would leverage that reflection so we would get better every time we got in front of an audience based on what we were learning successively. And that's kind of like you know, a decade looking back, what's the best, worst, and most surprising aspects of PTA Global? Oof. How does that Oof. show up in your current work? Oof, <laughs> this is a big one, Hopper. Come let's let's more. start with the best. Well, yeah, I was going to say, if you're going to follow the game rules traditionally, everyone has yep. to do best. Then everyone has yep. to do worst. Then you have to do most surprising. Then you can yep. do double dips after. But you have to do it. You have to do... <laughs> don't be double dipping your chip first time. Uh, no, we're sticking with the best. Keep it succinct. Right. Well, for me, I, I still... I'm just going to go with my heart. The best is that it, it even came to fruition. Mm. And I say it for so many reasons, because A, our industry, in spite of what it claims, is not one of collaboration for the most part. Mm -hmm. It's not one of innovation for the most part, because the statistics show we're still pretty much doing the same impact as we did 30 years ago in terms of people moving regularly, people active as a way of lifestyle in fact we're going backwards in terms of lifestyle health so my point yeah. is we're not exactly collaborative 
We're not exactly innovative, but I tell you what, we do not share best practices. We, we do not like to say, here's what I think is the greatest thing right now. And I got it from Bob or Mary or Sue. We, we are not good at what I call resources and sources. Here's where I got it from. Here's another great place to learn more. We are just so... Uh, we don't reference terrible. often. We are terrible at sharing our sources and resources. And I think the fact that we at PT Global, here's what I'll always remember, again, as the last one at the table, was I looked around and there were people, to your point earlier, Bob, who you were told keep away from each other, from Paul Check to Tom Purvis, that, you know, not only people told us... you. Yeah, I wasn't going to mention any names in this, but thanks for that. You're welcome, because I love them all. I paid them all. I study under them all and I reference them all. So I ain't got a problem mentioning them. They're, they're, they're my mentors and I reference them every day that I teach. So I'm good. Fair enough. That. You told me. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> it's my point though. People said, you'd be crazy. You won't get us in the same room. We did. 26 yeah, of them. Oh, God, we got yeah. them in the same room on the same vision with the same PowerPoints and the same the fact that that even happened to me still today resonates as the greatest gift of PTA Global is that when we woke up with this brain fart of an idea, all the best in the world said, I want some of that. That to me, I don't know how you beat. That we were just a bunch of idiots around the table that said, let's give it a shot. And we all quit our jobs. We put our own time, energy and money on the, money on the line. And the best in the world said, I want a little, I, I think I want to get involved in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Sink or swim, it doesn't matter. Like how many people get to say that they did that? And yeah. for me, that, that is truly the, the, the greatest, I think, thing that it brought to the industry is that, that moment of possibility, right? That emergent oh. moment of what's possible is the people that wouldn't even stand to be in a room with each other all said yes. Mm -hmm. Like what the heck did we have? Whether we knew it or not, that people mm. said yes to it. I don't even know how to describe it, but that's that, what I, I would say it, is the greatest thing we, we did. I think that for, for us, I know for me, that was just a heart punch. So like, wow, that brings me back. And it's so powerful. Mm. I think people listening to this right now, understanding that people with great ideas and work ethic and sincerity you know, 95% of all businesses go out of business within the first five years, the majority of those within the first year. And then, you know, the majority of those that are left after the first five years go out of business after, you know, the next five. So the, the, the amount of businesses that fail versus succeed and to be able to have that business go global and involve the people mm -hmm. that it involved that were the least likely people to ever work together. Yeah, that for me... It is amazing. And, and when did we launch it? Worst economic crisis in a hundred years. Yeah, as soon as the economy collapsed, we're like, all right, yeah, let's launch it. But, let's launch. You know, sometimes- We I ended mean, up in 24 yeah, countries in, in 24 months. So there was something there, you know, boys, there was something there. Mm -hmm. There was something there. Ian. Well, Hoppo has hit the nail on the head because that would have been- no doubt my best my other best is relationships and adaptation mm -hmm. we built the strongest relationship that i've ever been involved with as a team of human beings and we also built the strongest relationship with every country we went into hopper that's what mm -hmm. i was so proud of that we could actually go in and resource refer help people understand better the people who were in part in part involved in pta global the the people who were providing information in that in that program in that platform so the relationships that we built with not just personal trainers or allied health professionals but the professionals who were providing content was just amazing and the most amazing thing that i've ever been a part of was our adaptability i can still remember we're at Loughborough university 2009 <laughs> We've got there a day early so that we that can do a team. That was a great event. <laughs> team you just got to say Loughborough. You just got to say Loughborough. Yeah. I'm, like, oh my I'm God. just saying, wow, <laughs> that was. Oof. And we're sitting there and we're sitting there on the Friday and I'll never forget it. We've got everyone set up. We're just about to start the meeting 
And one of the facilitators comes through and says, there's a hundred trainers in the gym waiting for your workshop to start. And we've gone, no, that's tomorrow. Because we're on the, th that's right, we're there on the Thursday. That's tomorrow on the Just Friday. They, well, they said, no, 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 they're, they're in the gym now. There's a hundred trainers in the gym. So we all look around and I go, yeah, I'm in. Roddy goes, yeah, I'm in. Your boy said, all right, we'll get the stuff organized. You boys got away. And away we went. We had made our workshop and it flew and it was fantastic. But to be able to adapt on the fly at any yeah, given time in any given country to create solutions, uh -huh. the best I've ever worked with in the world. That was a, that was a totally blonde event. I mean, brilliant event. That event was great. <laughs> um, but yeah. I, I have a little bit of a different member. I don't even remember the workshops, to be fair, in 2009. Um, I was I very distracted. That the whole time, Bobby. I was distracted <laughs> that year, but uh, yeah. That's true, though. And, and actually, now you mention that, mate, that was multiple times yes. that we turn up. In fact, we got to a point that when we created our global, quote, master trainer, educator, in, you know, network, we said, you should be able to go get on a plane with a single Correct. A4 piece of paper and teach Correct. the entire certification. And that's where system sciences and tools came from was yep. we were like, yep. what's the one page that if you're sitting on a plane for 14 hours going to China with a different culture, country, time zone, language, language. Pilot, <laughs> and they've got no audio visual and no equipment in no space, you better be, be able to teach our course. That is the litmus test. It like, like, because I, I remember, I, I, like I've been in organizations where I'm teaching and th they'll look at me and go, okay, well, how long is this slide going to take exactly? I was like, I don't know. I haven't gotten there yet. Like, don't you have a notes page word for word where, no. where, where it's down to the exact minute? I just got a picture. It's like, I'm like... <laughs> If you've got to do that, it's funny because I, I did that earlier today, but if you've got to do that, you should not be teaching your subject matter. If you cannot, sh if you can't show up with a single page or nothing, or nothing and still teach just as effectively as if you had like PowerPoints behind you, you're probably, I mean, I, I, there's a whole rabbit hole we can go on this, but you probably shouldn't be teaching your subject matter. And, and I just want to say, in my defense, when I said I couldn't remember anything, I was very well behaved in these events. For the people listening, I I, I am not someone who misbehaves at conferences. This particular conference good. had a particular person, and it was it was very different. So just yeah. <laughs> Hold on, doesn't he dig himself a hole? For a bloke who's so smart, no, doesn't he just? I'd love to have him in a funeral in a funeral business. It, I don't think back, he eh? digs it anymore. I just think it's like a shadow. It follows him. <laughs> there's, a, there's just a, a hole wherever he goes. You're like, Bobby, be careful. There's a hole to your left, to your right, in front of you, behind you, below you. There's just a hole a fall in at it. all times. So, don't move. Yeah. So, yeah, getting back to, you know, teaching off a page. Okay, excellent. Um, best, that was one of our best. gifts, though. That is definitely one of our best. Is we, we took this complex 50-hour certification, 20-hour mm. bridging, 12 hour advanced, you know, exercise and stress management course, behavioral change and exercise course. And we could get on a plane to anywhere in the world and say, give me a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And I reckon, I reckon I can impact and influence a room of people. For oh, the yeah. And I don't want and to go I, down a rabbit hole, but we've kind lost cool. Matt. We've lost respect. We're losing respect for mastery. It's about doing, 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 doing. Yeah. And it's like, there's no cliff notes version of this. The reason why we were able to do that. Yes. We spent a lot of time thinking about how to streamline it and how to teach it, mm. but we spent like how many, how many 15, 16, 17 hour days did we have drilling no. and drilling and drilling and drill like yeah. uh, with each and other, just in the room. Each other. Yep. We would sit down and say, dude, you said this, that wasn't cool. You said this, that was brilliant. You forgot this. We, we, and there was no animosity or emotional triggers. It was just like, you wanted to know, boys, what did I do today? Yeah. Which certification it was, was it this? It was very rare. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it was ACSM, mate. Have you been paying attention? It's called a, How to Dig a Hole Without a Shovel. <laughs> Author Bobby Capuccio. No, but I want to chime Just in for my, for my best. Yourself, because for me, the best was working on the team. Because I, you know, it, it helped me clarify my own values because I have, you know, as, as you know, and 
the listeners probably suspect, I have a lot of personality flaws. I have a lot of character flaws. And one of them is, I, you know, I would get caught up in what I believe I should value versus what I authentically value. You know, it, it whispers to you at first, but it gets louder and louder until that whisper becomes a roar. And for all the times I was told, well, you need to create your own brand, do your own thing. I had zero interest in doing that. And if it wasn't PTA Global, it was BTA Global, Bobby's Training Academy Global. <laughs> PTA Global stands for Personal Training Academy Global, by the way. Uh, yeah. And um, that's for the listener, not for you. Uh, and, and, you had far too much time to think about that, Hoppe. Yeah, but I, I would. I just came up with that on the fly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure you did. And, Absolutely. No, but I, I wouldn't have been interested in doing that. Not only would I have not been interested, but I wouldn't have learned as much and it wouldn't have been as fulfilling. It was not to make this airy fairy or sentimental, but being on the road with people I loved and respected and could learn from made the work so much more challenging because a lot of times we would hold mirrors up like you're saying, Hoppo, to one another and you can't read your own headlines because someone who, who you love, but is your business partner will go, nah, you could do better. That's not right. And, and yeah, we, you we had, had some you had to tough, adapt. brutal conversations, boys. That oh my God. I'm I, tell you now, I couldn't have handled from anyone else, but from you lot, I took it <laughs> every time. But from anyone else, I would have been, you know, I, it was amazing what I could take from you boys and be like, holy crap, I need to go think on that. It was I, unreal. I work with a lady right now in my current organization who sat in on one of the first PTA global meetings and she got like this, this person is just brilliant. Like she's, she, she's like got to have like at least 140 IQ. But when she sat in, she was saying it looked like we were about to get to a fist fight, but you like, we were nose to nose. And, and that was, that was the culture that I don't think Richard as the CEO encouraged. He demanded that he demanded that raw conflict in the name of the mission. But like two seconds after that, we were out for beers and we absolutely loved each other, but it, it was, and we were better the next day when we did. Yeah. And yeah. that's what yeah. made so it that's rewarding. The we, we actually did. <clears throat> we took the feedback and applied it. And Richie, Boydie is the epitome of that vulnerability I was talking about. I'd never in my career met a, a leader like that who was so vulnerable. I, I don't even think he would have considered himself that way, but mm -hmm. his emergent presence was unparalleled for me. I, 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 you talk about meetings of the mind, you talk about PT Global, you talk about the many other things he's done. There was no job description for what he did. There was no path. Yeah. He, he, he blazed it out of pure existing in the possibility of what's possible that that exactly was it for it me up. for me it was it was the team dynamic it was the crystallization yeah. of my true <clears throat> highest values and the challenge and measure of support that i got from the team in reference to those values yeah. and that that to me was the best so what was the worst aspect of pta mm -hmm. global who wants to go first? Well, we might as well follow the same pattern we just did then, Dodgy. One, two, three. Oh. I don't want to upset your OCD. Oh. No, but I'm, I'm trying to filter my bad language. And I'm, oh, all right. Um, <laughs> it's, it's changed, right? It's changed. All right. What, what I would have said a year ago, four years ago, whatever, it's changed. I think today the worst part for me is seeing the impact and influence we've had in the industry claimed by others. And I don't mean that from a reputation or reward standpoint. I, I, that's irrelevant. It's ir absolutely, it really is irrelevant to me. It's literally having people around the world. We all do the same thing. We travel all around the world. I have had people in, I'm gonna give just one example, in um, Thailand, a conference come up to me and after a presentation recite our pta global work to me and tell mm -hmm. me that i should go take the course it's like someone yeah. reading an author's book and saying i've got a really good book for you and it's your book like <laughs> I, I have lost count 
of how many times people <clears throat> reflect back to me our work and have no idea it was our work. Yeah, it, it, it is. That's the worst. Mm -hmm. The flip side of that coin is it's kind of awesome that we changed the industry like that. And it could mm -hmm. be there's many big brands out there, big certifications that now have behavioral change and exercise, now have functional anatomy, now have energy systems mm. in the curriculums, now have mm. mobilizations. I'm like, mm. you didn't have that prior to 2009 when you were our students and our master trainers and our, I know that to be true and so do you. So I'm not dropping any names, but the worst today is still the fact that there are people out there. I go back to the very minimal requirement of reference your resources and your sources. Yep. I don't yep. care that you use our stuff. Just say where you got, tensegrity from or fascial anatomy from or just just say because i know for fact you were in the audience so mm. please just just be honest about where you mm. got it from that i, I think me I, I, as think a human being. I think it's the it honesty does. because here, here's where here's where the this bothers me deeply because i think we have the same grievance but we see it a little bit differently maybe there were people that I had worked with prior to PTA global, but I'll just leave it at that. And every time I would talk about coaching and behavior change and, and, and in their defense, this is going back as early as 2000, 2001, I sounded like a crazy person because I like, like you Hoppo came from the clubs and the reality of the club is very different than the ivory tower and what works yes. and what's needed is very mm -hmm. different. And these were people who thought I was insane. And then they were like, oh, behavior change, coaching, absolutely. But I know these people and they would jump into it and they would research it and they would apply it constantly. Like these people are borderline obsessive compulsive. And then in a lot of cases, they would go out and they could teach it as well or better than me. And I'm like, okay, cool reference where it came from because i think that is integrity and what that does for the listener is it ex it it expands their exposure to the same subject taught from different vantage points styles and perspectives which elevates their learning experience and it's the right thing to do here's where it really bothers me if you are someone who has never been a department head, not, not the head of a club, not a district manager, not, not a corporate executive, a department head. And let me be very clear. Department heads have a really hard job. And if you excel in that job, well done to you. A lot of accolades on a lot of levels, but you've never had to bring a team to mid month, close out end of the month, close out. You've never struggled with that dynamic You've never had to progressively elevate your performance, both in, in the people area. I think people are, is basically all the business is, but also within terms of the hard metrics month to month. If you've never done that, you stand up in front of a room of managers and you tell them how to do that. You're dishonest. You've not only stolen information, but the people in the seats have more nuance and expertise than the person in front of the room. And what you're about to tell them, it's going to hurt someone. They're going to apply it and it's going to do damage to their family and their career. It is the shittiest thing you could possibly do. So if you're taking my content and you're teaching it and it's not, it, people don't even know it's mine, but you're doing a better job or an equal job. Okay. It's about getting the information out there. If you haven't done it, applied it, you haven't developed mastery on it, you're trying to give something which you do not possess. It, it, it's really bad news. And in Singapore, like I was in the gym and I was wearing an E3 t-shirt. Remember those? Yes. Mm -hmm. And E3 wasn't even something, it wasn't even something that was a PTA global thing. It like, you know, everything we did, we shared, but that was truly a thing that I had brought just, just in one kind of venue and hey this is cool this is stuff i've used in the past i created and it was like oh did you go to that did you go to any pta global courses you know that's you learned that from so and so and so and so mm -hmm. was not part of our team when we were building yep. pta global 
and I like so and so a lot. And I can, and, and this, this person's a gentleman and they're a weapon, but that kind of stuff, it, 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 it was a piece simple, of your soul there. It wasn't theirs to offer. That's my point. Exactly. So it wasn't theirs to offer. Now, if you offer it, you just say, man, this was offered to me. I'm offering it to you, but just know it came from them. You, you I've got thousands of slides like you do in my mentorships, online courses, whatever. And you'll see all of your names and everyone else's names on the second slide of every thing. Cause it's like, here's my resources and my sources and here's the courses they teach and here's their mm. pictures. I'm not lying. I've yeah, done that I, my I, whole think it, I think it's a fear it, that if it, I got to be the crazy. source of my info, mm. but, but when yeah, that's like just for... insecurity and fear, right? That's, that's what I'm saying. That's just insecurity and fear. But anyway, that's my worst is that I know that we brought PT global by definition referenced our resources because they were in our videos from Gary Gray to whoever, like we didn't hide, like, we're getting this stuff from Tom Myers. We're mm. getting this stuff from Annette Lang. It's pretty yes. obvious. Cool. But you couldn't be You have over. to do that. But then there was our stuff that was mm -hmm. definitely our stuff. And a lot of people have taken that stuff. And I see it all around the world today. And people don't even know it's our stuff, let alone reference it. That would be nice. They don't even know the origin of the source. And honestly, I'm not just saying it because you're on the call, but when people constantly use your two's work around behavioral change, neuroscience, communication, fascia, mobilizations, observing, asking, not telling OD. I see it everywhere. I'm like, yeah. I'm, in such, I'm like you, you're speaking like that you read that in a textbook, but you didn't because it's yeah. not in a textbook. It came, I know where it came from. Mm. So that is truly my worst is that in spite of the fact that we didn't necessarily quote succeed in the way that a business would like to, but we did in many other ways that are immeasurable. Um, people are now benefiting and succeeding from our gifts and they don't even have the decency to, well, actually they may not even know where it came no, from. That, no. that might be the worst part. If they don't <laughs> even know, they don't know the source of some of our information. Yeah, those are two different painful. scenarios. Though. Right, maybe the second one's more <laughs> yeah. painful to me. Because when someone tells you to go read your own book, they clearly don't know it. you wrote the book, right? So <laughs> I honestly like don't care about that. I just find it funny. It's entertaining. I don't care. It's, what it it's the other like, scenario. I'm that saying really what it represents. Me. What it represents is a, a general industry problem that like do your homework and know where the information came from. Yeah. So my worst is going to be very relevant to what you're saying, but it's also my worst has driven me to take I think all of us have gone now to where we need to be. So my worst yeah. is the fact that we didn't get a chance to finish the contract. My worst is the fact that, and what I mean by that is that people think they know what we're talking about, but mm. they've only touched on the minutest part of what we brought to PTA Global. Hence why now, in two weeks time, I closed this studio for 22 and a half years to follow wow. my passion of Feel Soma because Feel Soma was my fascial mobilizers, my self uh, fascial mobilizers, my self osteofascial engagement, blah, blah, blah. All of that scientific rationale, applications, techniques, and so forth. Now my passion, it's like pivotal coaching, right? Now you and Haley get an opportunity to show the brilliance that you have and an understanding and now the true authenticity of what pivotal coaching was about. The ESD was just a poof dean of what you bought to people to give them a taste of what they potentially could become. Bobby, your ability to be able to communicate, to be able to create solutions from the aspect of another person's perspective is second to none. And no one can replicate that. Yes, I agree exactly with what you know you were saying. Rodney's systems ability to be able to think and, and, and put into systems. Michelle's brilliance from reading comic books to quantum physics and his understanding of the body sec second and boy's ability to be able to connect. But no one can replicate what we do. So my biggest disappointment was we didn't really get the true potential as a team to be able to finish our contract because I feel as a team, we would have really seen this surge in how we could really affect the industry. We touched on it, we created a wave and that wave's still going. And as you said, Hoppe, we're seeing other people now using 
our so-called information, but they're not using it the way it was truly designed, created, authentically mm -hmm. applied because they don't understand the values behind what we've done. See, there's an irony there. And the irony is, you know, if you're trying to produce a tangible result in your business, all your focus and energy and efforts need to be driven to produce that outcome. And very often that mentality is what destroys or limits the outcome you so desperately want to manifest. Mm -hmm. When we started PTA Global, it was about us, the team. It was about the people and bringing value. And we was like, if I bring value and if we go out and we serve people, the numbers will show up. Mm -hmm. Then people got involved in the business. It was like, look, no, no, it's about the numbers. It's about the money. We got to put that first because we get the money, then we can add value. You know, even if it's diluted a little bit and it's like the second you start making your business about hitting those financial outcomes, especially a business that, that was new and, and started in such a dynamic environment, what made that business was people going, hey, I love this. Wow, I get this. You start taking your focus off of the people and off of the team the wheels will start to come off. And, and it, that, that's interesting. Like for me, the worst part about PTA Global, to be very honest, it was my own inauthenticity. Like PTA Global taught me so much about myself, many good things, but it showed me a lot of ugly aspects to my personality. And on, on, the, on the good side, it was about being on the road with all of you. And I, I can't even describe what that comment Why is that happened. inauthentic? Well, That's here's why. No, well, he, he, here's, here's why I'm, I'm, here's where I'm going. I pulled a gun, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, you're halfway around the world. <laughs> oh, I reckon it'll come through, <laughs> it'll come through the lens. <laughs> if I start shoot, shooting holes in my computer screen, I, I, I think I think my neighbor might take issue with it. Uh, I might have to end this when the police come kicking down the door. But I think you'll be okay. No, keep it on. I'm going to want to see that. So, so, and thank you for listening to another edition of the self help Agenda. So I, I think what, what happened was I started to, given my background, PTA Global was becoming a surrogate family for me. I was like, all right, this is my family. The, the, you know, these are my brothers. And I think I started telling myself a story of who people on the team wanted me to be. And I started changing, not what I believed, but how I communicated and delivered what it is that I believed in a way that would get me the most amount of acceptance within my family. And I didn't realize this. This is not something where I was like, hey, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change my presentation style. So this, <laughs> it, was to, it was completely subconscious. And I, rather than being present with the audience, I was trying to figure out who did my team want me to be? And, and, and then all the, because you're talking about what made PTA Global. It wasn't the elements, but how the elements were brought together. And it's almost like you start removing ingredients. The recipe is not going to taste good. And I started removing ingredients that made me a valuable member of the team in the first place. And that was very interesting. And then, you know, th things started to happen from there. You know, like, like we had not, not me and you, but me, me and Hoppo, um, we had a falling out of our own, a falling out that, you know, in retrospect, I'm grateful for because what happened well, after, well, it, well, it's, <laughs> it, it's not, it's not what happens, right? It, it's, it's what's the response after. What's the outcome? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's like, I'm, this is probably a really bad analogy. You know, somebody's running down a hall, they smash right into you. They knock you over. Okay. That, that's going to that's gonna create an emotional response. What does that person do? Like the other day, like we were driving, somebody pulled out right in front of us in the car. 
Like it was like how we didn't have to jam on our brakes to look who bothered to show up, Richard Boyd. Uh, right at the uh, end, Richard as we're saying Boyd. goodnight. Are you yeah, kidding yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So as he's logging on, like we nearly got into an accident. And if she would have looked out the window and been like, oh my God, I'm so, you know, hey, it's fine. It's totally cool. I might have even felt a connection. But she basically put her middle finger up to us. It's like, fuck off, deal with it. That's a different response. So I, I think what I learned about you and me and from each other after that response, I think it kind of long-term strengthened us, Papo. Um, I don't but- know. I got my finger up right now. I don't know if that's <laughs> So nothing's ever really changed. <laughs> Boy, no, I, I never did. It, does, it you, answers your question, what happens when someone bumps into you? You, you punch them in the face. That's what I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to reach for an analogy, but um, apparently I'm not great on analogies today. Apparently Here's Richard Boyd is not great on logging on today. Oh, oh there hey. he is. Hey. Hey, hey, hey. We started this, like, we started this like an hour and 20 minutes ago. We're wrapping up. up. Yeah. Thanks you for told, joining us. You told me one o'clock, Capuccio. Is it not one? Was it? it it's one o'clock. Well, it can't be one o'clock right now because it's twenty-one past the hour. No matter where in the 21 world. Twenty-one past one. Is it? Yeah. Uh, hey, Alpo. Okay. So he's, he's only twenty-one minutes late, Bobby. Not an hour and twenty-one. <laughs> My apologies. Yeah, Very sorry about that. Hello, buddy. mate. How you doing? I'm ready for bed. It's, I, I should have been in bed two hours ago. Oh shit! Where's Ro- <laughs> where's where's Roddy? We told Roddy that you were coming. He's like, oh, fuck him! I'm not coming yeah. on. This, this this sounds like a this sounds like a, a meeting we would have in Loughborough. <laughs> where's Roddy? Where's where's Hoppo? Where's where's yeah. Michelle? <laughs> anyone anyone spoke to Moose today? No, don't know where he is. Roddy's probably enjoying a double someone's bourbon buying, right now in front of the, the fireplace, out the back of his boot. Yeah. Hoppo, <laughs> where are you? I'm at home. At Chicago? Yeah, mate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, nice. Given us all, that, all that's going on in the world, there's really no travel. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No travel for me, mate. It's been a long time since I traveled. Yeah. I think last time I spoke to you, I think one of the last things you did, were you, was it Brazil? Was that ages ago? I've done a lot of Brazil, but yeah, it probably was a lot ago. Look, look, Bobby's like, all right, we're in a podcast. How do I get this back to a podcast? Because he's like, this is going to just be a catch up now. Boy, no, no, be- I, I mean, like, I'm <laughs> sure the listeners are fascinated by how many times, like, Hoppo's been to Brazil. I mean, it's, like, everyone's DMing me, like, listen, great podcast, but what I really want to know is how many times has Hoppo been to South America? How come you never covered that? Yeah. It's like, Does okay. he really punch people when they bump into him? <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, you the missed that. Is yes, and the other one is seven. So yes and seven. <laughs> we only got to best and worst. I think boyd has gone. He left. He's like, okay, these clowns. I'm out of here. But no, I was, most surprising. I was going to ask before we even get into most of it. We might not even get to most surprising. Um, no, we'll probably have know. to have the surprise episode later for part two. <laughs> Boydie, well, let, let's get your feedback. You know, because you you were Uh-oh. the CEO. You were the leader of PTA Global. When you look back on the lessons, what was the best? What was the worst aspect? Keep your pants. Oh, gosh. I think, you know, I think if, yeah, I'm not sure what you, what you guys are saying because I'm, I'm on a bit late, so I apologize. But I think the best aspect for all of us was it was probably some of the most interesting and exciting times of our lives. You know, I think we, um, I think we all wanted to work together and it was the first chance for us to actually all do it, you know, all do it in one place. And we got to see each other so regularly, even though we all lived in you know, all lived in different places. But San Diego became just that bit of a hub for us, and it was yeah. just amazing that we we all got to spend so much time together. And so I think we just grew some pretty amazing friendships. And what I love the most is, and I still remember clear as day, is when we were going through content outlines, we were up on the roof of that place in San Diego, which had that amazing view, and we'd all oh, sit up yes. there in, in the afternoons. Oh. And some of the debates we had were just so brilliant. Mm-hmm. And it was yeah. and it was one of those things where the whole group had so much respect for each other, but we all very much disagreed on many things. And it was amazing that we could all, you know, at times get together and just basically, you know, really hash something out. And at the end of it, some of the ideas we had were so solid and such good and creative ideas. And I think it wouldn't have happened unless we all came at it from different angles. And and but we were all respectful enough to 
to listen and sort of work through work through the argument. And then at the end of it, it was, I mean, I think it obviously bonded us for life, but I think it created some really great structure. And I think, you know, the thing that drove into, when I look you know, how we sort of ended up forming PT Global, I think it was really all formed from the fact that when we all trained ourselves and then when, when we all traveled as trainers, you know, educating through PT on the net, I think what we all realized is that there was a lot of trainers out there that just weren't connecting with their, with, with, you know, with the, with the client in front of them. And I think we really felt that that was a really big, important missing component. And, you know, I think a lot of people may have looked originally at some of the content headings that we use where we had things like liability and, and we had a lot about meeting people where, the, where they were supposed to be met. You know, I think it all really stemmed from the fact that we really wanted these trainers to, not just do another certification, but actually learn how to connect with that customer. And I think, you know, one person that, that I know all of us were, were in the room at that time, it was in, it was up in Breckenridge, I believe, for a meeting of the mine events for um, PT on the net. And we had all these amazing presenters from all over the world, including, you know, all, everyone on this call except me. Um, and it was really about, um, you know, you had, you know, you had um, Charles Pollockin talking about all these Olympians that he trained in Czechy and you had Brian Grasso and you had, um, you know, all these amazing presenters. But the one that moved all of us the most and the one that was the most controversial was mm -hmm. Annette Lang. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember it, it, it's the reason why I think she's still the best trainer in the world in terms of someone that just goes and trains people individually, not as a coach, but just as a personal trainer. I still think she sort of holds that mantle and it was because you know, I remember her speech was, you know, she had this little Jewish client, she was about 85 years old, and she never left her house, and Annette would, would meet her at, at the front gate, and all they did was, for the first couple of weeks, was walk around the block, and then she dropped the bomb on everyone by saying that she still allowed the client to smoke, and I remember everybody was, like, flabbergasted, and all the fitness people were very righteous, and they're like, how could she- A lot let of pearl collection in that room. Yeah, there was. It was, and it was just amazing to think that she ultimately said, you know, as this lady got healthier, then the first thing that she decided to do, not me telling her what to do, was she gave up smoking. And, and I think that was something that just resonated so deeply with us that we really felt that that's what the industry was missing was that approach. And I think PT Global, we embraced a lot of the, I'm not saying it was just Annette's philosophy, but I just think her, her words that day were very deep and, and really resonated with us because I think we all agreed with it. And I think, um, you know, being able to work with all of you guys in that environment where we created some, I think, really clever content that if, if, if a trainer really did go through that, it would really help them, you know, to, to, to coin Roddy's term, which I think we've all used a lot now is to meet the person where they need to be met. And I think, you know, I, I think it made a big difference. And I, and, I, and I think we would have all liked to have seen that gone a lot further in our careers, but we sort of all had to merge off into some other, other exciting things as well too. But I, it was definitely, um, for me, it was, you know, bringing together great friends to create, you know, great friends who are obviously very, very good at what they do. Um, but then also, I think our message was really, really succinct at the end of it. Not at the start of it, but I think at the end of it, we were so, so well connected and we really had a vision of what we wanted it to be. We wanted these trainers to know how to be, how to deal with the person in front of them, not just talk about fitness crap and not just talk about they need to give up all the things in their life, which they love, but able to work with them at their starting point and then, and then get them right up to the performance level if that's where they wanted to go. And I, and I think that was pretty huge. Wow. Like you encapsulated everything we were talking about for like 90 minutes. We might have not come on this, we might have not come on this talk. <laughs> Could have did Absolutely. like 10 minutes with Richard Boyd. Oh, yeah. I, I think you're fluffing his ego. It made no sense to me. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, we, we can literally do a five hour podcast. Um, I don't think the audience would be keen on that. We could come back for a part two, but I just want to say, thank you. We're going to wrap this up here. I, I want all of you to come back. Boydie, maybe you can even like show up on time. That would be yeah, amazing. Right. So well, thank I you. Contact, all. I did just for the record, I did contact Bobby yesterday thinking it was yesterday because it was the 20, it was the, <laughs> It was the 12th in Australia yesterday, you knuckleheads. Zoom should yeah. like uh, the Zoom like, invite yeah, should have adjusted like, to, to the time. He's having an aneurysm yeah, trying to work that out. Yeah, doesn't, doesn't like it, Shrek. <laughs> yeah, Hopper, there's no way I was going to figure that out mathematically. I was just hoping that, you know, nope. I saw the 12th, so I logged on. 
All right, Bobby, well, what, Bobby, it's like, it's like Einstein is... talking algebra to kindergartners. Not going to happen. That's coming from a bloke who was averaging a million miles a year traveling the world that he couldn't work out the time from the States to Australia. <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, retired from that, buddy. Oh, we are retired from that, buddy, aren't we, eh? At the moment. And that concludes but, hey, actually, this just, episode. Bobby, <laughs> go on. Let What's me just it? wrap up, Bobby, go. for you, though. One thing I do want to say, though, is um, Instagram destroyed the fitness industry and basically made a bunch of young people who look fit and sexy turn them into experts, which n n none of them are. So anyone on Instagram who thinks you're a fitness expert, please get off. But what's brilliant, though, is um, just how... I'm, I'm glad that was nuanced. It didn't just, like, broad brush everyone on Instagram. Like, <laughs> I appreciated how measured that comment was. <laughs> no, only if but you I look think, good. You know, he did say if you look good. So if you're ugly on Instagram, we're keep safe. Doing what you're doing. We're on. Oh, great. Yeah. If you're ugly, well, that was my, well, I was getting to the point was is that all my friends are old and ugly with PTA Glow, and that's why none of them did well on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you back for another episode. Here's a couple of key takeaways from my perspective. First of all, let me just say that the views and opinions of Richard Boyd do not necessarily represent those of the self-help antidote. But to Richard's point, popularity and aesthetics do not necessarily make you an expert. The consistent development of mastery through craft and the ability to discern distinctions from which you can offer value, that makes you an expert. This goes beyond just personal experience. If you needed a total knee replacement, for example, would you rather have an orthopedic surgeon who studied anatomy for years, who was mentored through painstaking surgical practice, or someone who said, well, let me do it because I've had four knee surgeries myself. Oh, and my friend Bill lets me practice on him. <laughs> what? That would be insane. At the same time, popularity and having a great body because you practice what you preach doesn't mean that you're not an expert. Both can coexist. And the truth is that both of these people do coexist on social media. The issue is when the public can't tell the difference. The issue is when the rigor of developing mastery and real expertise is eclipsed by pretense. That's when people might not get the value that they expect or worse, it can do them a lot of harm. We are not our clients. Meet people not where you are, but where they themselves need to be met. Number two, the only thing you ever really have is people. The people you serve and the people on your team. If your culture's weak, your customer experience is going to be diluted as well. Number three, focus on the process. Obviously, outcomes matter. Yet, focusing exclusively on outcomes creates devastating blind spots. You risk becoming deflated by your failures and inflated by your successes versus being in a state where you can learn from both. Being in the process keeps you present to notice what's happening around you as well as within you. It keeps your process evolving. Results are the product of behaviors and processes. The more you're engaged in the process, the more engaged and hopefully the more you're going to be in love with your craft. And this keeps you motivated, creative, and collaborative. And finally, relationships. Relationships are critical to performance and happiness in life. As much as you can, do what you love with the people you love because life is too short. So if you enjoyed the content on this podcast, please subscribe, leave a comment, and a five-star rating. If you have recommendations around the subjects you want us to explore or authors you'd like to hear from, visit us at theselfhelpantidote.com and share your thoughts. This is Robert Capuccio. Until next time.